You can see the swan in her nest over there. There was... You can see some geese with their newborn swimming along here. Today we're going to talk about William Jennings Bryan. Because if you understand William Jennings Bryan, you'll understand the late 1800s, early 1900s fairly well. Um, the DBQ is unlikely to be about William Jennings Bryan, William Jennings Bryan himself, but it's important to kind of understand what's kind of going on with this. It's a nice warm day, it's starting to get warmer. And you guys have a lot to be positive about and a lot to, to be hopeful for. So let's talk about William Jennings Bryan here. And so William Jennings Bryan is uh, one of the greatest figures of the late 1800s, early 1900s, political figures in America. Um, Democrat, also a populist party guy. Um, runs for president three times, uh, 1896, 1900, then 1908. Um, he's running for office and uh, one interesting thing is is he's the youngest person ever to get an electoral college vote at the age of 36 remember you have to be at least 35 to run for president and at the age of 36 he's going to be the youngest what is that one two three four five six seven eight looks like at least eight uh, the Canadian geese young there looks like there's at least eight um, but uh, so let's get into William Jennings Bryan here and so let's kind of zoom back out you can see the geese there out in the lake I'm on my cell phone camera so it's <laughs> not the best but uh, here we go let's uh, look at this here so we'll get a good view of the page so if you want to hit pause on the YouTube screen you can kind of see what's going on here and I'll look at it again but uh, you can see what's going on here but William Jennings Bryan um, the panic of 1893 is huge um, you have the Gilded Age you know of the 1870s 1880s into the early 1890s this Gilded Age the, the second industrial revolution is in its heart and a lot of people feel as if they're not getting um, as much out of the economy as they should be. You have this massive economic downturn. And it doesn't start to recover until 1897. So you yeah, 1893, 1894, 1895, 1896. All down years. It doesn't start to recover until 1897. Moreover, we're not fully recovered until about 1900, a lot of people say. Uh, so... So it takes a while, and and one of the one of the effects of the Panic of 1893 is that wheat prices go down dramatically, and a lot of farmers start over farming, which makes wheat prices go down even more. But the fact of the matter is, farmers are hurting, and so this is going to help the growth of the Populist Party or the People's Party. Uh, William Jennings Bryan is going to wind up being a presidential candidate for uh, the People's Party in the 1896 election and the people's parties are kind of it's like a populist party for farmers and um trying to stick up for farmers rights hey hey railroad companies you're exploiting us you, you don't have the right to uh charge such high rates and and so forth and so you look at this uh people's party um very pro-farmer and our uh, the Panic of 1893 also encourages support not just for the populists, populist party or the people's party, the farmers, pro-farmer party. It also encourages support for the free silver movement. Now, the free silver movement was uh, very popular amongst farmers, especially the miners out west, too. But free silver, what they mean by free silver is no, the government doesn't give everyone free silver. What they mean by free silver is this, is they, it's an inflationist monetary policy, an expansionist monetary policy. They want The gold standard is very restrictive on the amount of uh, dollars that you can have. If you have a true gold standard, you can only have as much dollars in circulation as 
the government has gold um, that it's holding. And so a lot of farmers feel like uh, they want this free silver. And so free silver would mean if anyone brings silver to the government for a small fee, they could have that minted into a silver dollar. And this would increase the amount of dollars in existence. This would increase the amount of dollars in existence. Um, and so this free silver movement was, was very big amongst the farmers. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute here. Um, so, uh, so the Panic of 1893 creates support for the Populist Party. The farmers are hurting. And also the free silver movement gains support. William Jennings Bryan becomes a national hero. He already had a political career going, and he was, he was a rising name, but he kind of becomes a national hero at the Democratic Convention in 1896 here. Um, and so he gives this speech that's known as the Cross of Gold speech. In fact, um, during the Cold War, Eisenhower gives a Cross of Iron speech, which is similar in kind of mirroring just kind of Cold War and we're spending too much money on military's Eisenhower's theme. But this Cross of Gold speech, uh, where uh, William Jennings Bryan is saying the little guy, the poor farmers, and even the little industrialists, but especially the farmers, they're being exploited by this gold uh, standard, which helps the big banks, which helps the big businesses. And uh, th this unlimited coinage of silver on demand, anyone who brings silver, the government has to, on demand, turn it into silver dollars for a small processing fee to, to mint it into a silver dollar. And the farmers are dramatically opposed to the gold standard and support free silver because they believe that this inflationist policy will help them. Farmers are massively in debt. You know, by the 1890s, a lot of farmers are starting to buy agricultural machinery that puts them into debt. Some farmers might have bought land on debt, bought, si bought uh, went into debt to buy silos or build barns or whatever. But the fact of the matter is farmers are massively in debt. They're hurting during the Panic of 1893. And so the fact of the matter is if there's inflation... As dollars become more abundant, they are less scarce. Things that are less scarce tend to lose value. So, if there are more dollars in existence from something like free silver, dollars will lose value, meaning the purchasing power of dollars goes down, the, the price of objects that you buy goes up. So, the farmers are thinking, hey, that's going to help things like wheat prices and other farm products go up in value but more importantly we're massively in debt if our debt is at fixed rates it'll be easier to pay off that farm debt that we have as money uh, loses its purchasing value over time uh, think about this you might have heard your grandparents at once say like oh for a, for only a nickel I could buy a moon pie and a coke and uh, you're like, sure, Grandma. You know, like, you know, it's like a, you know, you can't even buy a Coke for a dollar at the gas station anymore. A twenty ounce Coke. And what are you talking about? You can buy it for a nickel. Well, they're telling the truth. That's inflation. And so, if the farmers have fixed debt payments, and there's inflation, it'll be easier to pay off that debt. It'll be easier to pay off that debt over time. So the farmers want these inflationary policies like free silver. Of course, the miners do too, because silver will have more value. In fact, the fact of the matter is, is that um, silver um, will be overvalued compared to what is in Europe, because a lot of the, a lot of the free silver people are saying, peg silver to 16 ounces of silver equals one ounce of gold. Well, in Europe, it's not that. And a lot of the gold standard people are saying, well, like the, the gold will just uh, go out of existence. People will hoard it and hide it and or take it out of the country. Um, and so that's why a lot of these businesses oppose it. But also a lot of the banks oppose it because if there's inflation, the farmers are going to pay back less for their debts that they owe these banks. So the banks oppose the free silver, this inflationary policy. So the farmers and miners are kind of on one side. A lot of the big businesses and banks in the East Coast is on the other side. You see a lot of the free silver have lots of support in like the great out west and like the Great Plains um, area and uh, the South. And you see 
the gold standard have more support in the Northeast where it's established, where you got big business, where you got banks and so forth. The Spanish-American War springs up. He's initially a big fan of this. Hey, William Jennings Bryan says, look, everyone deserves the right to govern themselves and liberty and the Declaration of Independence should be applied to all people. And he's, he's a massive, enthusiastic support of the Spanish-American War because we're going to liberate Cuba. Spain is not treating Cuba properly uh, in William Jennings Bryan's mind. And you know what? We're going to liberate Cuba. We're going to free Cuba. That's awesome. And he actually helps recruit people for this war. Um, and is a big supporter of it. But then he's outraged by the end of it. Because at the end of the Spanish-American War, the U.S. is like, hey, we're going to take control of the Philippines. Hey, we're going to keep Puerto Rico. Hey, Guam. And, and so the Philippine-American War starts, and it becomes massively disillusioned because we're no longer fighting wars of liberation. He sees it as we're fighting wars of, of an empire. Imper America's acting like an imperial power. And he, he uh, starts supporting the American Anti-Imperialist League, who actually sees him at first uh, as not loyal, not somebody they can trust, because he had initially been a big supporter of the Spanish-American War. They eventually gained support and trust him. But the fact of the matter is, uh, William Jennings Bryan uh, is a huge uh, uh, guy who's saying, look, uh, America's acting like an empire. We shouldn't be fighting in the Philippines to take them over, even if we are promising to set them free at a future date. Hey, we, we shouldn't pushing our, be pushing our way into China with things like the um, open door policy, um, where America's, uh, you know, Canada, or excuse me, I don't know why I said Canada, where Japan and the European powers have already gotten into China, and America's trying to push our way in with the open door policy. He's, he's, he's opposing a lot of these imperialistic actions. And so the fact of the matter is, he becomes like this anti-imperialist uh, speaker. Um, and he's saying, look, the U.S. needs to be neutral so he can be a trusted arbiter of world disputes. And, uh, and we're behaving like the British Empire. That is hypocritical. That we want from the 13 colonies opposing British rule, no taxation without representation, to behaving like the British Empire that we thought was so horrific, uh, you know, uh, previously. And so he's saying America is kind of turning its back on its anti-imperial tradition, and that's a bad thing. Um, moreover, he's this big Democrat. He had been in the Populist Party, been in the Democratic Party. Um, like I said, he had ran for office in 1896, 1900, 1908. And so in 1912, Woodrow Wilson wins the presidency, a fellow Democrat, and he becomes part of the Wilson administration. And the Secretary of State back then was considered like, like the top cabinet position, probably still today maybe, but especially so um, back in that era. And uh, he's eventually going to resign despite getting this, uh, this prestigious position. Um, initially, he's uh, trying to take the Secretary of State position. And he's trying to undo a lot of, like, the previous presidents. William Howard Taft, for example, had been doing the dollar diplomacy, where America uses its financial weight and our big businesses to try to gain influence and gain sway in a lot of Latin American countries. And the fact of the matter is, um, you know, uh, William Jennings Bryan's trying to uh, undo a lot of this dollar diplomacy, seeing that America's kind of acting, maybe not imperial in the military way, but imperial in a financial way, and trying to kind of undo this. And he gets very disillusioned with Wilson. He had put up with Wilson kind of invading several Latin American countries, which he had kind of disagreed with, but went along with. But then when Wilson's becoming not neutral in the, in the early stages of World War I, he wants, William Jennings Bryan wants to be neutral, and Wilson's not heading that way, and is clearly starting to take a more British and more pro-French um, uh, stance. Wilson, uh, William Jennings Bryan then resigns from the Wilson administration, saying that uh, America needs to be neutral in such disputes um, and resigns. Uh, one other interesting thing 
about uh, William Jennings Bryan here is uh, he's kind of like old school in a lot of ways. Look at this, the Scopes Trial, 1925 in Prohibition. He's a bit old fashioned. Uh, 1925, there's this famous Scopes Trial where the state of Tennessee had made a law saying that you can't teach evolution in public schools. And uh, basically it was like a show trial, like the date in Tennessee had uh, wanted to uh, drum up some tourism, get some attention, fill up their uh, businesses and hotels and restaurants and things like that. And so they basically uh, tested this law and it had good publicity and it became a national trial. William, William Jennings Bryan, not from Tennessee, born in Illinois, uh, made his name out in Nebraska. But uh, the, the fact of the matter is he, he goes to Tennessee on behalf of uh, the prosecution that, hey, you can't teach evolution. And he, he's, he speaks out against the wrongs and evils of teaching evolution. And he's very biblical. And um, although... The substitute teacher kind of gets in trouble. He's not in seriously. He gets like a fine and people pay it for him. He's not in ser ever threat of serious trouble. Although William Jennings Bryan technically wins the case, most people paying attention think that Clarence Darrow, this famous lawyer, sticking up for uh, the substitute teacher had taught evolution. Uh, most people think that Clarence Darrow just cleaned William Jennings Bryan's clock in, in, in the court case. But the fact of the matter is that's William Jennings Bryan, you know, speaking out on, in the old fashioned, the rural, the, the, the traditional America in this case. William Jennings Bryan also publicly supports prohibition. Hey, you know, alcohol causes problems. It creates people to sin. It creates other problems in society. We need to do away with this great evil, William Jennings Bryan thinks. Um, he's always trying to get rid of evils, and one evil is like you know the gold standard. You will not, you know, like the gold, the 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 cross of gold speech, where he says you will not crucify mankind on the cross of gold. That the big businesses are crucifying, exploiting the the workers and the farmers, and, um, and you know, always very biblical with William Jennings Bryan. This, you know, uh, and um, he, he gives a speech about how like if uh, the cross of gold speech talks about how if all of the cities burnt down and were smoldering ruin they would be born again fresh from all of the raw materials and the supplies of the countryside the farmers but if all the farmers had their farms burned down and the cities were left untouched the cities would wither up and die that the true heart of america is the farmland he's always sticking up for these farmers the populist party um, and so forth. Uh, and and uh, so you can see that with this traditional values, with prohibition and uh, being against evolution in the Scopes trial. Um, but in some ways, he's also ahead of his time. Uh, for example, women's suffrage. In 1910, before the majority of America was in favor of it, in 1910, he came out on behalf of a nationwide women's suffrage amendment in 1910 before it was popular before it was common to do so uh moreover he had proposed direct election of u.s senators he had supported that he also supported ideas of uh if congress doesn't listen to we the people we the people can propose ideas of bills and then have a re national referendum national referendum to vote on it so in some and that's kind of a very populist idea um, and so William Jennings Bryan's an interesting guy um, and he's very emblematic of all the different things kind of going on in the late 1800s early 1900s guys hey leave a comment and if you want in the comment section about uh, whether you like or dislike William Jennings Bryan or maybe it's kind of more neutral or maybe some things you like some things you dislike that's okay too but guys stay positive uh, there's a lot of hope and you guys can earn some college credit if you're in the AP class or taking AP classes. So study for your AP classes. Guys, have a good day.